Hello booktube, welcome back. I'm Heather. This is Recently Seen Reading. I've got hopefully a short update on a couple of books I've read in the last week or so that I thought were great and I wanted to share um, a little bit about the books. Uh, there are two uh, books that, of, um, that fall into kind of the biography category. One's a, a collection of letters and the other is an edited memoir. So the first one is The Letters of Sylvia Beach, which was edited by Carrie Walsh and published in 2010. The name Sylvia Beach might be familiar to you because she owned and ran um, for many years Shakespeare and Company, a famous bookstore in Paris. She uh, also was one of the early publishers of James Joyce, so she's typically um, most familiar to people because of her bookshop, which was also a lending library, um, and her work with Joyce. So this is a, a collection of letters that are selected from multiple places and multiple people's archives, and that's one of the really great things about it. Carrie Walsh has pulled these letters from Beach's um, records, from other people she corresponded with, HD, Breyer, that whole crowd. So it comes from many places. And the letters cover Peach's life from the time she was 14, 15, 16, writing to her parents until oh, her 70s or 80s when she died. She died in 1962. And so it covers her full range of her life. Um, the, the letters are very circumspect in some ways, or the ones that have been chosen are circumspect. You'll, for example, hear um, Adrienne Monnier mentioned she was uh, Peach's lover, uh, but there's not... Um, any very obvious um, discussion of their relationship. One of the things I think that would be helpful if you wanted to read this collection of, of letters would be to be familiar with the context because some of the relationships amongst the people make more sense um, if you understand the literary context in which Beach was working. Um, so there was a book on Making the Rounds last year, the year before, on Booktube, a collective biography by, let me get the name right, Diana Suhani, um, No Modernism Without Lesbians. And if, if you're interested in that topic, um, reading Suhani and then either Beach's memoir or this collection of letters would, would be a good pairing. So, so the letters themselves are um, a range of just ordinary family correspondence, detailed correspondence with authors, financial accounting, responding to people wanting copies of books, um, letters discussing um, Joyce's work, um, ultimately letters discussing the difficulties she had with James Joyce, who was not always um, particularly kind to her, um, and letters that kind of help um, help you maybe understand the conflict they had when he um, removed his publishing from her and moved it to the States once she had made his um, his work publishable. So quite an interesting set of letters, if you, uh, particularly if you're interested in the literary context of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. It, it also covers the time um, just after World War I when Beach was working in Bulgaria, I believe, uh, for the Red Cross and her frustration with the bureaucracy there. Um, along to the time where she set up her shop. Um, not very much in the collection about um, the period she spent in turn in France during the Second World War. And a really fascinating chunk um, at the end of her life when, when she closed Shakespeare and Company and um, she was trying to find ways to support herself. She had very generous friends, so Briar and H.D very frequently sent her money and care packages well into the, the 50s. Care packages that included everything from food to warm underwear. Um, but the letters are really illuminating on Beach's struggle to sell her archives. And her archive would have included some of Joyce's manuscripts, so she would have had the papers but not the right to publish them. Um, her own letters, letters from people corresponding with her, first copies of first editions, all that kind of thing. And there were significant struggles over these papers. Um, certain scholars felt entitled to them, other people thought that they had the first right for publication. Um, Beach wanted to make um, um, 
a return from them. She wanted to be financially compensated for her efforts uh, in both supporting Joyce, um, publishing Joyce, collecting and maintaining and preserving all of these records through, you know, the depression, through disastrous events in her apartment. Floods were pretty, pretty common. Um, her upstairs neighbor, neighbors were not particularly good at um, keeping the, the taps turned off. Um, through, you know, the conflagrations of the Second World War and the kind of the way everyone's lives got shattered and moved around a lot. So it's very interesting from that point of view. And if you're, if you're interested in things like the market in writer's letters, there's a, a good book that came out two years ago, I think, by Amy Hildreth Chen. Um, what's its full title? Placing Papers, The American Literary Archives Market. Chen talks about um, the market ooh, in the later in the 50s, but you can see in, in Beach's letters that the part of that heating up the market and the competition amongst um, scholars and the competition amongst libraries to get all or part of a, um, an author's uh, papers was starting to heat up. So this one I quite enjoyed. It's a well put together collection. It's got a little bit of prefatory material. It's got pretty decent footnotes to help you figure out who's who when Beach starts talking to people but doesn't explain who they are. It's got helpfully at the back a list of, of people and their names. Um, I think if I remember correctly, their, their dates and a very brief description of who they were and why they mattered. So helpful um, if you're coming to Peach's letters with you know not a broad understanding of the context. And I certainly spent some time flipping through those details to try and figure out, okay, who's this again? Who's this? So I highly recommend that one if you're interested in that period. The second kind of biographical type book I read and really enjoyed, and I enjoyed this one far more than I expected to, is um, a book by Charles Ritchie entitled, I'm going to get the title correct here, An Appetite for Life, The Education of a Young Diarist, 1924-1927. So this was published in 1974. And if you've heard of Ritchie at all, which is you know, unlikely, you've probably heard of him through um, his association with Elizabeth Bowen. They were lovers for a long time, decades. Um, so a long, successful relationship. Um, I think your husband was okay with it. Um, Ritchie is a generation younger than Sylvia Beach. So Sylvia Beach was born in 1887 and Richie was born in 1906, so they're a generation off from each other. He he was also a Canadian diplomat. He uh, worked his way up through the diplomatic service and worked um, in various roles for decades, um, both overseas and in Canada. And in the 70s and 80s, he published a series of diaries and they were incredibly popular at the time. And I, I didn't pay any attention to them. I had other things on my mind in the 80s. And, and you can tell in reading these um, that they've been polished up a little bit. And I've decided to start with um, re the first one chronologically in his life, so the ones that co cover the, um, 1924, 25, 26, and 27, rather than starting with the one he published first. The memoir falls into two parts. The first part covers his life from the time he's so oh, 18 to the time he's 20-ish, so 24, 25 to 26, just a little bit of 26. So the first part, he's what, 17, 18, and he's like all 18 and 19 year olds, fussing at his, his need to go to school, ang anxious about um, a girl who won't pay attention to him, a competition with his friends for her attention, um, very interested and very curious about sex. The book is quite frank about his his interest in sex. The second part of the book is set in Oxford. In two years he spent in 27-28 um, studying there. He didn't do as much studying as he should have. It, it's very much a portrait of Oxford, of the bright young things, the roaring twenties. Um, he and his friends he makes are spending far more time drinking and smoking and chasing women and gossiping about each other and then they are uh, apparently studying. It, it's a very vivid portrait. His writing is quite zippy. Um, frank in some places, um, 
positive representations of women in some places and very naive and sometimes like callous representations of women. Um, his, he and his friends all did foolish, foolish things, you know, like getting very, very drunk in his rooms and one of them shooting a gun out the window. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. Injured a pedestrian and lots of drama ensued. Um, she was fine, but lots of drama, but whether they were going to be sent down or expelled, they weren't. Lots of drama and lots of foolish carrying on and that's part of what I loved about this book. It really is a portrait of an adolescent, um, but an adolescent from well, nearly a hundred years ago and it's very clear in its um, depiction of what what the, the positive things about late adolescence and early adulthood is and the negative things, just the folly of it all, just folly. If you like reading about the Roaring Twenties and if you've enjoyed say Brideshead Revisited or um, Dorothy Sayers, Peter Whimsey, um, that kind of thing, you might enjoy uh, Charles Ritchie. I don't know that this volume is still in print. Um, lots of copies are on the secondhand market and most Canadian libraries, Mancadian academic libraries would have copies of this available. So those are two books that I recommend that I've read in the last week or so um, that kind of overlap in kind of culture and attitude, if not exactly in generation or nationality. Uh, what else is going on? I'm finishing up Sea of Tranquility by M.I. St. John Mandel. This is fine. It's um, not a spectacular book. It's not the perfect match for me because I often struggle with time travel mechanics and it's a book that relies on time travel to, to move the plot and the character development around and at some point in every time travel novel I've ever read I get annoyed at the um, discussion of the mechanics and the possibility of time travel. I just get impatient. What else? Oh, Kate Hartfield. Kate Hartfield's The Embroidered Book. This came out earlier this year. Kate Hartfield is a Canadian fantasy and science fiction writer and The Embroidered Book is a historical fantasy. It's quite a chunky book and it's set in 18th century France and Austria and Italy in which Marie Antoinette and her sisters use magic to manipulate um, the political and cultural events around them. This I'm probably going to DNF. It's due back at the library at the end of the week and I put it down, you know, at the 150 page mark because I really wasn't getting into it. I was picked it up because I'm interested in Hartfield as a writer. I've read some of her novellas that are also set in the 18th century. And I'm always interested in works that are actually set in the 18th century or, the, or very early 19th century, but I'm, I'm struggling with this one largely because it's um, historical fantasy. And I, I often have difficulty with novels that have a lot of world building in them. There's something about it that I usually don't um, connect with very well and it, it's often connected to um, how well I'm enjoying a plot and if the plot slips away from me somehow I, I don't um, do well in reading the the world building so that's probably going back to the library unfinished. In the week coming up I've got a stack of things I want to read. One is actually a reread. It's a reread of Kate Beaton's Ducks Two Years in the Oil Sands which there's a fair amount of buzz about. It came out on the 13th of September. I had pre-ordered it and the bookstore I bought it from made it available a little bit ahead of the date. So I've read it and now I want to reread it. it. There's lots of buzz about this book. It is great. It is a fabulous memoir, a fabulous graphic memoir. Um, I'll probably talk about it more later, but if you can get your hands on it at a library, you will not be disappointed, I think. Um, it's a bit pricey um, as a hardcover right now. It's In Canada it cost me oh, $41 um, and I don't regret spending that money at all. The other thing I'm hoping to read this week is Maggie O'Farrell's The Marriage Portrait, which is waiting for me on the library's whole shelf. I want to run and pick that up today or tomorrow and hope to read that. I probably will only have it for seven days. The library system here has a, a process of limiting um, the length of time you can keep uh, a very popular new book in particular. So seven days should be enough for me to get through the latest O'Farrell. I've been looking forward to that. 
I have also uh, Martova Janssen, little tiny book, uh, novella, fair play, that I've been trying to get to. It's tiny and it's a, a novel about, or a novella, about the relationship between two women who live in adjacent and adjoined apartments, um, uh, who are both artists of some sort. I want to get to that, it's part of my kind of shorty September pile. And I also want to read um, Ardeth Wynott's most recent book. It's called um, Insurgent Love, Abolition and Domestic Homicide. This came out last year from Fernwood, which is a um, socialist radical press in Canada. And it's a, a discussion of a very common and unfortunate um, thing, domestic homicide, but written from a, an, a prison abolitionist uh, point of view, I think. So I want to read it. I don't think reading my spatter is going to be particularly pleasant, but I'm looking forward to um, having it done and getting, growing what I understand about ways of tackling um, domestic violence, essentially. So that's the best of my reading from the last week or so. There's Sylvia Beach and Charles Ritchie, some so-so stuff in the middle that I currently have underway, and a small stack of things that I'm really looking forward to reading in the next few week or so. I hope you're having a fabulous reading week, whether you're reading one thing or a dozen things, and that uh, all is well with you. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.